Good morning, church. Good morning. Well, it's good to be seen. <laughs> As I always heard from Brother Derek, you know, every time I uh, say it's good to see you, and he would reply back, it's good to be seen. Amen to that. <clears throat> really good to be seen. And there's another uh, thing that I've learned from Brother Derek, I think last week, but I will not, uh, I will share that to you next week. <laughs> Aside from being good to be seen. All right. So in a few days, um, a new U.S. president will be declared, you know, going into the last stretch of the uh, the election. Everywhere I go, when I turn on the, uh, the TV, politics are uh, heating up. <laughs> and uh, each one has his own opinion to who is the best um, suited to be the next uh, president. Right? And um, what normally happens is that we listen and pay attention to information that goes with our opinion. Right, and uh, normally we we shut down, and we don't listen to the opposing side. We would only listen to uh, our side, you know? and uh, we applaud, and uh, we say, you know, we applaud and we we listen um, to those views who are the same as us, and uh, we sometimes yeah. We are right, you know, and uh, we boo those who differ with us and uh, say you are wrong. And in psychology, you know, this is uh, what they call confirmation bias. Okay? Is the tendency to listen more often to information that confirms our existing beliefs. Through this bias, people tend to favor information that reinforces the things they already think or believe. Confirmation bias doesn't seek uh, out objective facts, not seeking objective facts. Um, interpreting information to support your existing belief, only remembering details that uphold your belief, and ignoring information that challenges your belief. And confirmation bias, this is not only happening in politics. This is also happening in spiritual matters. And uh, many factors affect a, a person's bias, like culture, beliefs, values, and, uh, and other things. Now, some experts, they call this as a systematic error in thinking. Why? Because as you've seen, Okay. As you can see, it doesn't seek out objective facts. It only sees himself, all right? So, and uh, it only seeks out his own truth. And when you do that, as we have said a couple of, or many weeks ago, there are only two truths, the relative truth and the uh, uh, absolute truth. And people are into more on the relative truth. Okay? Because again, uh, in relative truth, what you feel, what I feel, what you know, what I know matters in relative truth. Okay? Like for example, if I say that uh, in and out burger is the best burger, and probably you would say, nah, Probably Burger King. Those are relative truth. So your feelings, your taste buds, your know-how matters, right? Now, in terms of um, absolute truth, okay, our feelings doesn't matter. What we know, it doesn't matter. Okay? For example, one plus one equals two. It doesn't matter if I feel and believe that one plus one is equals four. It doesn't matter. 
Because everywhere I go, everywhere you go in this country or in, in the world, one plus one will always be two. So that's absolute truth. Now, in spiritual matters, the Bible is our basis for the absolute truth. Okay? It doesn't matter what I know. It doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what you feel. What matters is what the Bible tells us. And Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, Jesus was talking about the absolute truth because there are no lies with God. Now, here's the best part. The best part is the word of God that would sanctify or make us holy is Jesus himself. Why? Because John 1.14 tells us the word became flesh and made this dwelling among us. Now, if we go back, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. And Jesus Christ is the word. And we all know that this is Jesus Christ pertaining here in John chapter 1, verse 14. Now, not only Jesus is the word, but he is also what? The truth. He is the absolute truth. So sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them. Jesus Christ would make us holy and through Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us the truth. And Jesus tells us in John 14 verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. There is no other way to salvation except Jesus alone. All other ways will lead us to death. Absolute. There is no other truth on how to be saved than through the word, through his word that we could read in the Bible. Absolute truth. Now, outside of the Bible are all lies. Now, he is the source of eternal life and the life. Without him, without Jesus Christ in your life, you will have eternal death. That is the absolute truth. And it says no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. It's only through him. Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. It's only through Jesus Christ that we could have eternal life and that we could go through the Father. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. Now in our search for the ultimate answers to life, the Bible is our ultimate guide and the ultimate truth. It is the ultimate source of our truth pertaining to life, pertaining to spirituality. Now our lesson, our title lesson for this morning, stop, look, and listen. A call to obedience. Now let us go to our itching ears. Right? In our scripture reading, thank you, Brother Alex, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Our scripture reading tells us to do what? Now it says in verse 1, so we must what? We must listen. Listen very carefully to what? To the truth. For if we don't, our disobedience will be punished. Right? Now, so all of us, okay, all of us, all of my loved ones and friends, okay, those are, who are in Zoom and those who are watching us, you know, it is our call that we must not take for granted even for a second or think that even for a second that we could escape God's punishment if we will be disobedient to him according to Hebrews chapter 2 1 to 4 now they always say that God is love but we're always forgetting the other side of the coin the other side of the theology that God is a God of justice if we continue to neglect God 
there is what we call disobedience and there would be punishment. Now, stop, look, and listen. Let us remove our own bias. Let us remove our biases and listen to the absolute truth. Even, my dear brethren and friends, even if it hurts your ego, even if it hurts your ego, you listen to the absolute truth, you listen to the Bible. I would rather have my ego hurt and live with Christ than die with my ego and burn in hell. Amen to that. Now, some people, they seek truth. We want to know the truth. So we go and seek for the truth. But unfortunately, when presented with the truth in the Bible, you know, they question the truth. And they don't want to accept the truth. They are seeking for the truth, but when confronted with the truth, they don't want to accept the truth and they will uh, challenge. Okay? They will deny the truth. They question the truth. They don't want to accept the truth. Now my question is why? But why? Well, because it goes against their own truth. Because they have their own bias. So what uh, do these people do? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. You know, they will search for people. They will go out and search for people with the same views that they have. Because that's what their itching ears want to hear. They don't want to get offended. They don't want to learn the truth. Because they will be offended and they will go, it will go against their beliefs. So they will go out to some other group of people and they would listen to that group of people because, wow, I love this group of people. Because it goes with your beliefs. But when you are confronted with the truth of the Bible, when you are reading the truth in front of you, through the words of God, and if it goes against your belief, it hurts us, it offends us, and we don't want to listen. We don't want to listen. Now, this type of people doesn't really want to listen to the truth. See, They just want to hear confirmation that would reinforce the things they already think or believe. Okay. The word sila, the Hebrew word sila, is used in the context of songs and poetry. Now, we could see this often in the book of Psalms. If you try to read the book of Psalms in some other translations, um, at the later verse, at the end of the verse, you could see the word sila. And it is also in the book of Habakkuk. Okay? Now, Sila, it means pause, suspension, to reflect. To stop, pause, to suspend, and to reflect. An example is in Psalm chapter 3, verse 2 and 4. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Sila, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Sila. Now, this would suggest that the listener, okay, the listener or reader should take a pause and think about, contemplate, you know, about the message of what was said. Think about the meaning. Okay? When we are singing, think about the meaning of the words. Think about the meaning of the lyrics. Now, this tells me the reality that... Hearing, hearing is easy to do, but listening is harder to do. Hearing is much easier, but listening 
is a bit harder to do. Just a while ago, Brother Kennedy mentioned about singing, worship. You know, some people sing hymns and praise to God, but they don't understand what they are singing. They don't understand the meaning of the words. They sing probably because they just want to sing. As pointed out earlier, it's part of our worship to God. When you sing, don't only sing with your heart. Don't only sing with your mind. Sing by knowing the meaning of the words. Sela or sila. You pause and then you reflect on those words because those are uh, in those words there are meanings to it See? now we care sometimes we care much about the melody and we care less about the meaning and that happens to me it happens to me i would sing because i love the melody but you ask me did i know what i was, what I was singing no no, because I just love the tempo. I just love the melody. But I don't know the meaning of the song. See, the word sila tells us to pause, to ponder, and to reflect. See? Now, same with the Bible. Some read the Bible, some study the Bible, but they don't listen to what it says. They don't listen to the, mu to, to the music. They don't listen to the words. They don't listen to the meaning in the Bible. Now, if we are paying so much attention to every preaching, to every sermon that we're listening, you know, the same manner of attention that we should give to singing, the same manner of attention that we should give to reading the scripture. Now again, Sila reminds us to stop, look, and listen. Stop meaning pause and take a moment of silence. Look, you know, look again at what you are reading or what you are, what you are singing, what you heard, and try to reflect on those things. You know, find any truths, find any learnings to those things or in those things, and listen. Listen with your heart. Listen with your mind and do what God, uh, whatever God is telling you through those lyrics, through those words in the Bible. Most often we listen to ourselves. But may I suggest, don't listen to yourself. When you are truly seeking God, don't listen to yourself. Listen to God. Listen to God. Stop look and listen stop you zip it you throw everything that you know take down your pride take down your pride you listen to god look look to god look for opportunities to understand when you are reading the bible look for opportunities what you could understand in those uh in those verses Look inside you and open your heart, open your mind, but not your arrogance. And then we listen. We listen to God. Listen to what you are reading because remember, the words you are reading came from God. And it has a lot of meaning. And God is telling us an important message coming from those words, coming from the Bible. Now, sometimes it challenges us. It's a challenge because sometimes when we first read the Bible, we don't understand what we are reading. It's okay. It's okay that you don't understand. But try to read it again. Try to pray to God and ask God for wisdom. Ask God for discernment for you to understand. 100% I'm telling you, the next time around you will read the Bible, you will understand. You will understand. It happens to me. It happens to me many times. At first, I don't understand what I'm reading. I'm having a hard time understanding the meaning of the verses that I'm reading, but I pray to God. 
I prayed to God and asked God for understanding. And lo and behold, the next time I go and read about it again, I understand it. I understand it. And then when I went over it again, there was another message that God was revealing to me. See, just try to listen to God. Just try to listen with your heart and listen with your mind. Now again, sila, pause, ponder, and reflect. Do you know, or did you know that one way that uh, Satan is using to keep us away from God is busyness. Okay. Business is Satan's business of keeping our minds preoccupied in a way from God. You know, life has become, as I've seen it, life has become a, uh, an endless stream of activities, non-stop. Non-stop. You know, even for some people, it seems like the 24 hours a day is not enough. You know? And so many things to do. It's like crazy. Stop, look, and listen. The principle, apply the principle of sila. You know, pause for a while and take a look at yourself. You might probably be overlooking your health. You know, you listen to your body. Listen to your health. Listen to yourself. Okay. One time I was um, advising this to a friend of mine. And I told him, you know, you should take it easy. Pause, ponder and reflect. But he said to me, you know, Brother Mike, I need to work. You know, even uh, work overtime, even on Sunday, because I have a lot of bills. I have this and I have that. And I said to him, well, I cannot force you, you know, but it's okay. It's all up to you. It's all up to you. And then one day, I saw him early going home. I bump into him, and then I uh, ask him, oh, you're early. How come? And uh, he told me, ah, oh, I'm so tired. And I think uh, I'm going to be sick. So I just went home early. just want to take uh, some rest. And I told him, you know, take my advice. Go back to work. I told him, go back to work. Take your overtime. Because remember, you have so many bills to pay. This and that. And we were laughing. <laughs> we were both laughing. But, you know, he got the message. But we were laughing at it. You know, brethren and friends, we are so busy, we have no time for God. You know, the devil is so happy because we have no time for God. And he's cheering. He's cheering for us. He's rooting for us. Way to go. You know, way to go. I'm looking at Brother Jesse. You know, way to go. Be busy. Probably the devil is telling Brother Jesse, just for example, just for example, go Jesse, be busy. Go Jesse, be busy. You know. You see, the devil is rooting for us. The devil wants us to be busy so that even on the Lord's day, we will be preoccupied. Our minds, our bodies will be preoccupied and we, don't, we won't have time for God. The principle of Sila tells us to pause, ponder about your life. Where is your life going to? You know, reflect on Jesus Christ from whom all blessings flow. Now, in Psalm chapter 46, it has only 11 verses. Now, Sila was used three times in Psalm 46. And at the end, you could see it in, uh, I think, verses 3, 7, and 11. But in verse 10, I want to focus on verse 10. In between those verses, Verse 10 
is a well-known verse. Be still and know that I am God. You know, the background of Psalm 46 was about a, a war going on. There was a war and it was a call for God to, to stop the war, to end the war. So the word be still, it is not to, uh, to stop or to rest. It doesn't mean to rest or just to stand still. That's not the meaning of the word be still in Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. It means to let down, to drop, or to cease. Okay. So being uh, still or be still means dropping your weapons and stopping cease fighting. That is the meaning of the word be still. So by application, be still means cease striving so hard. We must cease striving so hard and stop being frantic. That is the meaning of the word be still. As the saying goes, you know, do your best and leave the rest to God. Or do your best and God will do the rest. Okay. But you know what? What our problem is, we, are, we do our best, but we leave God behind. Because we are so busy. Stop. Stop. Stop stressing yourself about the struggles and challenges ahead of you. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, the principle. Can any, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Now answer that truthfully. We cannot. We cannot. We cannot add a single minute, a sing, even a single second to our, to our life by worrying. Okay. So God said, be still, Sila. And he said, I am God. Know that I am God. The meaning of know, it means acknowledge, okay, be aware, acknowledge, know with certainty, being sure. Know that I am God. No, because you are certain. Okay. And what does I am God means? You go to your three omnis. If you remember the three omnis. Omni omniscient, uh, omnipresent, and uh, omnipotent. God is all that. The sovereignty of God. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is faithful. And that is what is the meaning of no, I am God, therefore, be still. Stop striving so hard about your life. God is in control. Know that I am God. Know that God is in control. Know for certainty, 100%, that you are serving an all-powerful God. So it means with my knowledge of God, who God is, I am certain that I can trust God. And I will not worry because God is in control. That is the meaning of Psalm 46 verse 10. Be still, know that I am God. The word Shama, or they pronounce it as uh, Ashuma. Now, did you know uh, about the greatest command? Why it is called the greatest command? Did you know why it is called the greatest command? Now, to answer that, let's see the background. When Jesus Christ was talking to this Pharisee, Jesus Christ was having a conversation. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Jesus Christ was having a conversation with one of the Pharisee, uh, an expert of the law. Now the question, there was a question there in verse 36, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? The question has something to do with the first 
commandment. And what is the first commandment in the book of Exodus? You shall have no other gods before me. So I'm just trying to give you the background of this. In Exodus chapter 20, you shall have no other gods before me. Now for the Jews, Judaism, you know, God is highly revered to be the most important, the greatest. Okay? Now, the answer of Jesus Christ in Matthew 22 is actually a quote from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Okay? Now, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, okay, it composed actually from, from verse 9. Chapter 6, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it is actually one of the most important parts of the Jewish culture, for it is recited daily. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9, in the Jewish culture, they recite that daily, and it is part of what they call the Shuma prayer. They recite that every day, okay, daily. Now, In verse 4, here, okay, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay. The first commandment tells us, You shall have no other gods before me. So it is like the same. Verse 4 of Deuteronomy and in Exodus chapter 20, they are the same. Okay. So they speak, both speak of one true God. And for the Jews, obedience is paramount. So number one, to the Jews, they revere God as the greatest, the most important. And for the Jews, obedience to the greatest is paramount. The Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4, 5 to 9, it captures the essence of obedience to God. And that is loving God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind or your strength. Okay. It means that we must love God with all of us. With all of us. Okay. Now, reciting this prayer every day reminds them to be obedient to the greatest being. It reminds them every day to love the greatest being, which is God. All right? So, it is the greatest command, the greatest commandment, because Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, starts with a command. And what is the command? The command is the word here. That is the command to obey. Because in Hebrew, Shoma, hear, it means to obey. The word hear in Hebrew, it is translated as Shoma. It means to obey. Okay. Obedience, active listening leading to action, emphasizes the actual action of obeying rather than thought obeying. It is more of an action, really obeying than only thinking about it. So the word here is from the word Shoma. That's why every day they have this Shoma prayer because it reminds them that they must obey the greatest being. So that's why when Jesus answered this expert of the law, when asked what's the greatest command, Jesus answered him, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Because it is indeed the greatest command. An obedience, a call to obedience to the greatest. And it starts with the command to obey. So that's why it is called the greatest command. Now the word here, as used in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it is like the word listen. Sometimes when we, when we use the word listen, it connotes obedience. Not only to hear, but it connotes more of an action, uh, uh, obedience. Okay. 
So the command to be obedient to God, the greatest being, by loving Him with all of our hearts, our minds, and souls, and that is why it is called the greatest command. Now, for the Jews, that is the most important. Okay? So that's why if we will go to Matthew 22, Jesus knew that this expert of the law was just trying to test him. Okay, he was just trying to test him. That's why this man in Mark chapter 12, this expert of the law answered to Jesus. He said, well said, well said. Teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is the most important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So that's why it is called the greatest command. Now, you see, we, we gain knowledge about God through reading, through listening, and through observing. But God called us to really listen to Him and read the Bible. As you read the Bible, you go through the Bible, you should stop, you should pause, ponder about it, reflect about those words, and look into yourself and try to navigate yourself through those words with that intent to obey God. You know, the problem with us, my dear brethren and friends, as we gain, you know, more and more knowledge, our head becomes bigger and bigger, but our hearts become smaller and smaller. We became arrogant. Pride creeps in into our hearts because we are gaining more and more knowledge. You know, knowledge should make us humble. Gaining knowledge should lead us to humility. But it's the other way around. Some people, when they gain knowledge, they become more arrogant because of that wisdom. And when, then when that happens, our hearts become smaller and smaller and our heads become bigger and bigger. Pride. See, pride. And pride is a, something that God detests. God hates. Okay. So if we listen to God, we listen because we want to obey. And we must live out His words. Now remember the rich young ruler, the story of the rich young ruler. Now, notice that uh, in Mark chapter 10, the story of the rich young ruler. Now, notice that this man asked a specific question. He asked a specific question. The question is, what shall I do so that I may inherit eternal life? Now listen to the answer of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now the answer of Jesus Christ, he said, you know the commandments. Okay. Now Jesus was well aware that this young man was a typical good person. Like many of us, he's a good person. If you, if you take a look at verse 21, it says, you know, looking at him, Jesus showed love to him. Jesus felt genuine love and compassion for this young man <clears throat> because he really wanted to be saved. So Jesus told him what he must do. And what was that? Jesus told him, sell everything, <clears throat> leave everything, and follow me. Now Jesus was pointing this young man to the greatest commandment. Make God the most important part of your life and obey him. Unfortunately, this young man, you know, cannot just do it. He just cannot leave his wealth and follow God. You see, many of us are like this man. We are seeking for an answer. We're trying to find the truth. But when Jesus Christ, when God presented us the truth, and the truth is in front of us, we will just turn our backs to God because it hurts our feelings. It offends us. We don't want to accept. 
Again, listen with an intent to obey. Listen to God. Uh, follow the concept of sila and follow the concept of shema. Obey. Listen to obey. Now, I would like to encourage you, let us not like, you know, be like uh, King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, 28 to 29. Let us not like be King Agrippa. After hearing the testimony of Paul, he was still blind to the truth. Can you persuade me in such a short time to become a Christian? Then Paul said, short time or long, Paul replied, I wish to God that not only you, but all who hear me this day may become what I am except for this change. May I encourage you, my dear brethren and friends, to approach God by applying sila. Pause for a while. Ponder about your life. Where are you going with all the hustle and bustle of this world? Ask yourself, am I really going to where God is? Reflect on God. Would you listen to yourself or would you listen to God? Now, I would rather listen to God and obey Him. And finally, let me leave you with these verses. James chapter 1, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Hebrews 3, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So it is important, my dear friends and brethren, to slow down. To slow down. Pause for a while. Reflect on your life and reflect on your relationship with God. And if anybody here are willing to accept the Lord right now, please do so. Please do so. As we have read, you know, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Now is the accepted time because now is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. We never know when. So it is my encouragement to come forward and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as you have this bread of life. And as we always say, it's always good to be seen. Always good to be seen. We always pray to God that may God give us another day in life tomorrow so that we could see each other tomorrow. God bless you all. You have the words of life. May we continue to be faithful. And may I uh, request everybody to stand as we sing the song of invitation. Good morning. <laughs>